Hello and good morning. Uh, today we are going to talk about data visualization in today's newsrooms, as mentioned in the headline. Uh, here is a kind of data visualization example that I created with Infogram. And here is uh, the minutes that I reserved for each subject that we are going to go through today. We'll start with brief introduction, then uh, some milestones in uh, data journalism history, then we will continue with uh, recent best examples of data visualization. Uh, some of them got awards, some of them have been nominated. And then we will go on with understanding uh, and visualizing data. I will uh, show what data visualization is, what data journalism is, and how we can understand and use data. Then we will go on with the tools of data visualization. Uh, I know it takes more time to learn tools, but I will just briefly introduce some data visualization tools for you. And in the end, for Q&A session, I reserved 15 minutes. Uh, normally, uh, it is never 15 minutes, because most of the time I use more time than needed. But sorry. Uh, data journalism is a journalism type, uh, which is done with data, driving on data. And it is mostly uh, in today's newsrooms, the best way of doing journalism. It's not only about maths or formulas or something like that. So you don't have to be a mathematician to be a data journalist. Uh, don't let people intimidate you by data. And, uh, you know, investigative journalism uh, all around the world is a great issue. And as we are going to see today, there are wonderful examples like CBS Leaks, etc., that we are going to cover today. And they are good examples of in investigative journalism and good, em good examples of data journalism at the same time. And, yeah, what do we do with data journalism? I know that numbers are boring. Yeah, it's for sure, especially for people who come from the social science. But here is the bitter truth. Numbers are not boring. Numbers are everything, even in social sciences. Most of the new papers published on uh, good journals are based on quantitative research, research on data, and everything is data now. Actually, I was in your place years ago and I was actually thinking that I don't like numbers. I hate numbers. I like qualitative research, qualitative work, investigative journalism, video. Yeah, but that's not the thing. That's not the thing New York Times is looking for. That's not the thing Guardian is looking for. That's not the thing uh, some niche newsrooms like Intercept are looking for. So now it is enhanced and democratized data journalism. It is not in the hands of a handful of people who know how to use some specific softwares like R. So this democratization effect of new media is felt in the field of data journalism. So there are some uh, explanations or some definitions of data journalism and what it brings to our lives. <coughs> in the end, yes, data visualization or data journalism is a kind of storytelling, digital storytelling thing. But it is not a story like uh, the ones that we mostly see. It is not only about who said what, who said it when, or something like that. It is more complicated, and it is real news. It is not quoting somebody. Even in CNN, on other big platforms, all we see is people who are talking all the time. It is not about people talking. It's about people doing something. Every activity that you do on your Facebook account, everything that you do on your time in Beirut through GPS signals, they are all subjects of data. So what should one know to become a good data journalist? So you don't have to be a good data journalist, but you just have to know some skills, basic skills. You should first know discovering data, which data is valuable, which data works for you. And you have to know how to collect data, which are data sources, what kind of data is reliable, what kind of data is not. And data cleansing. Have you ever seen a data set published, by, released by the government? It is 
completely silly. There are too many spreadsheets. These are really complicated. There are too many details that you don't want in governmental reports. You have to know how to clean, clean the data, how to take the parts that you need. And fact checking. Yeah, governments release reports. But you know, governments aren't the most credible information sources. For instance, if you ask my government, economy is going pretty well. So it's like really a complicated issue. This fact checking thing is even effective here. So of course, NIF's worthiness of data is also important. Most of the time, people should be interested in the data set that you are visualizing, that you are working on. And there are some uh, data visualization processes. All data visualization methods or processes are not the same. There are dozens or hundreds of them. Even Google itself provides 100 or more different types of data visualization preferences or choices. So you need to know how to choose the best type of visualization which is the best method. So, why data journalism and why now? Actually, it has always been about data journalism. For instance, Wall Street Journal started with data journalism. It was all about numbers. It was all about finance. It was all about informing people about the data created within stock market every other day. So, Financial, not only the financial reporting, it, was, it is not only about journalism. Physicians in eight, 1800s used data journalism or data visualization to understand how illnesses spread, like cholera or something like that. So there are, from Adrian Holubati, one of the pioneers of data journalism, here is a quote. Is uh, is it journalism to publish a raw database? It's a big thing. Everybody is uh, kind of discussing this. Yeah, there is data. Yeah, here is data. Look at my data. It is not a thing, of course. You have to visualize it. You have to make it understandable. You have to create a narration besides your data. But here, uh, there was an online discussion, and here is his comment. Actually, it is easier to access data more than ever now. Everybody, every NGO, here in Beirut, that's the same. There are too many NGOs, right? What they are doing? They are creating reports. Some of them are quantitative. And the government, most of the governments are now positioned as open governments. They are more transparent than they used to be. And the tools of the stat uh, statistician were not the tools, by large, of the reporter. It, it didn't use something like that, but now it is. Now, the tools they use are our tools. So, another thing, we need to rebuild, rebuild the trust in journalism. Why? Have you ever seen uh, some of the research made by Peer Research Institute in USA or Reuters News Support on digital journalism? They all say the same thing. This trust in journalism is in, in increase. So if you, if you show people the numbers, they will believe you. If you show people a man, mostly men, or a woman who is talking about some specific issue, they will not believe because people are subjective. It, they, in, in some aspects, data is subjective as well, but it is more reliable, especially after fact-checking. So now, I think all of you have LibreOffice, Microsoft Office, or Apple stuff on your computer. So you all know how to work on tables. There is no excuse on not working on a spreadsheet, a data sheet. Governments around the world are helping us, and data is leaking from everywhere. You know, WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, all investigative journalists around the world, too many whispers, in governments, so data is everywhere. It's waiting for you to catch it. So uh, here is a kind of generic slide about interest in data journalism. So as you see, it is in a big increase. It is the Google Trends. This data is gathered from Google Trends. So you see how it is increasing 
And you have to ask yourself, why haven't I studied data journalism before? Because for some of the people, it's too late. Most of the people who started their data journalism collectives got enormous grants from really big institutions, and they're making a lot of money. So let's start with some things. Here you see just Manigan and Edward Snowden. Uh, you know, data is coming from everywhere, and data is so powerful. It is not like any other type of thing, because data is most of based on reality. And now, employees of an organization who happen to have access to interesting information most of the time, when he or she feels that these data should be open to public, now they are sharing data. Yes, they are public enemy number one in their societies. Yes, investigative journalists or data journalists working on these issues are in a really bad situation. Let's take Assange. He is now completely isolated from everywhere. But let's start with some milestones of these leaks. WikiLeaks. It was not only about global politics. It was about everything that we know about the internet, about international relations, about politics. WikiLeaks changed the politics. Many people claim that it has something to do with uh, riots in the Arab world. Yeah, in somehow. But you know, what is really important with WikiLeaks is that it was one of the first examples or first global examples of data journalism in 2000s. It didn't provide too many good examples of data visualization like the other examples that we are going to talk about today. But in the end, it was a way of counter surveillance and it was interesting. Tomorrow we are going to talk about counter surveillance and surveillance a lot. So, they published Afghan war files and it's like uh, 92,201 rows of data. Have you ever worked on such a big data? Probably no. But these people did. These people created a big network. Actually, it was a closed network, so it's really hard. Ah, here's the thing. Data journalism is a team work. You cannot work on such a big data by yourself. Sometimes dozens of people work on data. Because newsworthiness of data is still needing some journalistic understanding of data. Because if you don't know the figures who are involved in these files, whether are they a CIA agents or are they workers in embassy or are they working for a kind of non-governmental organization in Afghanistan, you need to be a journalist in order to know these things. It is not a Google thing, you know. You need to have some insider information as well. So here is another visualization about data sets uh, published by WikiLeaks. Here we see another type of data visualization, actually. But you see, there are data sets or data from everywhere around the world. And many newspapers, newspapers in Turkey, newspapers in England, newspapers in uh, United States, newspapers here probably, they all covered these stories. Why? Because it was easy to cover. Assume that. Now, I sent you a Dropbox link, which includes one million files. How would you deal with it? Would you deal with it by yourself? No. But would you open such, such a data set, such a precious data set to everyone that you know? You don't as well. It's a kind of principal thing. So let's go to the Panama Papers, which I think is more and more important uh, issue because uh, here there is a good work. So you know Mossack Fonseca, this uh, company in Panama, and their emails are hacked. Oh, but it was fortunate for us, for the people who earn much less than the international elites, political elites, financial elites. So this kind of uh, 11.5 million leaked documents from their accounts were really hard to work on. And Edward Snowden defined it as 
the biggest leak in the history of data journalism. Yeah, bigger, bigger ones came later, but it was. So actually some of the files were dating back to 1970s. So 50 years. It is really huge set. You need a team to work on it. So uh, you, I think that most of you know about what Panama Papers were about. But what I'm more interested in is, yeah, you have a proper data set. You have a wonderful journalistic story. But what makes a story worth reading, worth consuming? I think it is visualization. So here you see International Consortium of Investigative Journalists website. And now here you see a wonderful way of, oops, mm -hmm. I, I think that I need to move a little bit, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so this website, now they categorized the figures involved in these data sets. And each one that you click on, here you see the story. What he or she has done. What kind of connections this person has. And here there is a, a classical mapping application that you can use. I, I'm going to show you some of them. Who he or she is involved in. What kind of corporations or what kind of political uh, institutions that he or she is involved in. So, there is this kind of related countries thing there as well. It's also important in my opinion because sometimes uh, it is impossible to tell everything with data. And as you see, there is a kind of little summary here. First of all, most of the people do the same mistake. They just use their Infogram accounts and they just create their uh, data as visualizations and they just publish them. It is not the way of doing data journalism. You, have, you still have to tell people what it is in, as short as possible, that's for sure, but you still have to use some text other than data, of, of course, in my opinion, because that's how people are used to consume data. Uh, I think that you can uh, discover the set later. Let's go, let's go on with our thing. So, it is not only about visualizing data, it is also about gamification sometimes. This consortium created a wonderful game that I would like to play together with you. Sorry for the ones who have played the game before, but let's see how to act, which one sh should we choose? Yeah, I chose politician and it ends really easily. So let's go to one penalty. So what should you do? Should you open a bank account in Switzerland or creating an offshore company? Yeah, let's go this way. So here, yeah, pick a nominee shareholder. Pick another nominee, people who, and I won. Oops, sorry. <laughs> here it is. So. Just put two. Okay, okay. So, you see. So, in order to uh, do this gamification thing, uh, I think they do, they didn't bother a lot. They didn't do a lot of stuff. They just made a thing that we call web app or mobile app. Uh, and these web apps are based on specific coding things. And they just combined them together and created such a game. But what do we get out of it? How football players are creating offshore accounts? What is the best way of creating an offshore account? How you should behave when you are creating an offshore account. It's not about how you should behave. It is all about telling you how politicians in your country did it. And why they are caught 
It's another thing. Some of them are called. For instance, if I chose the politician, somehow I would be called in a really little time. So let's keep on. So now, uh, as you know, many politicians resigned. Many people uh, in financial institutions lost their jobs. Uh, credibility of even the royal family of United Kingdom has been crashed by this stuff. It has caused protests in some countries and it created awareness that Mossack Fonseca was only one of them. It was only one of all those companies that we are talking about. So it's a kind of interesting thing. So you can hack another company company in Panama and you can get a data set from them again and you can get your own Panama papers. So you can get many awards out of that. So let's go to Paradise Papers, which also brings us too many good data visualization examples that I think that we can easily benefit from. So, uh, German reporters Frederick Obermeier and Bastian Obermeier from the newspaper uh, Süddeutsch Zeitung uh, were the ones who got the papers. And they shared this work with a network of journalists which has more than 380 people within it. So, it is a big work. So, data journalism is not only about working on data, it is also about your, your uh, ability regarding administrating human relations, administrating the secrecy of your operation, because someone can give away you. Actually, uh, in Turkey, while they were working on Paradise Papers, I knew that who were the people who were working on Paradise Papers. So it was a kind of bad thing in terms of the operation, in my opinion. So let's go. Uh, so here is another example that I'm going to show you. Donald Trump and his allies who were exposed by Paradise Papers. As you see here is another uh, good example of um, mapping, but here we map relations. Here we don't map uh, a geographic area or something like that. For instance, what he has to do with Trump, what kind of companies that he is involved in, some other people that are related to Trump, and what kind of money or investments and all other stuff they gathered through these processes. So it's a kind of complicated issue when you're talking about uh, this kind of political stuff. But here you see another good piece of journalism that you can do something like that, not as visually rich. If you have such a data set, you can do such a thing with graph commons, which is also a kind of open tool and free tool everybody can use. I'm going to show it later. So let's go back to the presentation. So Swiss Leaks is the name of uh, another journalistic investigation. It is published in February 2015. And uh, the information leaked from uh, the French computer analyst Hervé Falciani uh, on accounts held by over 100,000 clients and 220,000 offshore companies with HSBC. So, before these data leaks, we all knew that there was something going on in Switzerland's bank accounts, right? It's a, it is that story that we all talk about. But it was the first time we saw something like that. So, here is another example of data visualization. Here is how globalized finance is kind of related to this data leak. And you see a kind of uh, world map over here. Yeah, it is a world map. 
So here are the scales that they use, as you see, 20 billion dollars, 10 billion dollars, and each scale is symbolized by their size over here, what kind of money or what kind of accounts sizes are available there. So, what were the common points within all these uh, projects or sets that we are talking about? First of all, people worked in teams. I underlined it a lot. People who got the data first needed consultation of bigger group because you need security as well when you are working on data. Here, let's open another debate. We all talk about privacy, don't we? But especially the elites. Their privacy is more important than anything, right? I hate privacy. I hate liberal notion of privacy. I love socialist notion of privacy. Because if the elites, if the rich people of Lebanon, of Turkey, of United States of America are benefiting from privacy, and I am not as a citizen, I am not for that privacy. I am for a privacy that enables uh, counter surveillance. I am for a pri privacy that shows the relations between former Prime Minister of Turkey with Panama Papers and with many companies. I am for a kind of understanding of privacy which shows the relationships between Donald Trump and all other colleagues of him. So it is a kind of different issue over there. But for data, when, when it comes to the ethics of data, it shouldn't be your concern. Because rich people are making a lot of money on our backs. So don't bother about it. But there are some things that you need to consider. For instance, WikiLeaks has been criticized a lot, especially because they have uncovered dozens of US uh, sources uh, in the field. So what to do in these terms? Too many people working for other governments in a secret way, and they are exposed. Some of them died. And this was one of the most critical cases about WikiLeaks. I don't know, have you watched any of these movies about WikiLeaks? They were discussing this as well. But here is another thing. Have you ever seen Mark Zuckerberg's computer? Its camera is blocked. Its sound input is blocked. So yeah, elites are providing big security for themselves. Which means that all of them, all of us, are under a great surveillance. And I think that we need to know who are the spies in our countries as well. Or who are the people who are helping uh, these terrorist organizations like ISIS and all other stuff. So I really think that this ethics of data journalism is another thing that we should work on. And we need to work on it in a really careful way because classical understanding of data or liberal understanding of journalism ethics won't help us in that way. So let's keep on. Uh, yeah, most of them were based on data leaks. They included controversial information and uh, people who whispered or who leaked the data are, are under great risk. I mentioned Assange, I mentioned Snowden, but it is not only about them. People worked in your government, my government, who leaked data, they are also under great risk. In Turkey, a soldier, Utkukalu, was in prison for more than a year because he was accused of leaking data to a hacker group called Red Hack. So it's a part of branch of Anonymous. It is supposed to be like that. So whispering or leaking data is a risk that people take. You have to know how to protect your sources. It is really important. It is more important. It is the essential thing within credibility of your organization. So you won't be as lucky as the hacker who hacked the emails of uh, this Fonseca thing all the time. Sometimes you have to work with organic people who leak data. So data journalism needs a big organization. So, uh, let's keep on. 
So, yeah, I also, I mentioned all of these leaked data things, data leaks, WikiLeaks, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, they were all data leaks, hacked data, uh, former government officials leaking data, but it is not only about that. For instance, if you are making a new story about unemployment in your country, women unemployment, men unemployment, it doesn't matter. Pre uh, rising precarious jobs, rising full-time jobs, etc., etc. You still need data visualization and you still need data journalism. So data journalism is not about only working on some risky files. Uh, institutions release huge data sets every day. Uh, I'm going to show uh, Google's data sets. They are also uh, really good. They are providing data sets from a lot of countries around the earth. Uh, in various languages. So, also you can create your own data by yourself. I'm going to show, show it through some tools. So, now let's introduce you to some of the most successful data journalism outlets around the world. One of them is J++. I had the chance to visit them in their place in Stockholm. It was one of the most interesting teams that I have ever visited. So, they have different projects that I'm going to mention today and I'm going to show you. They do different things. They do commercial work, they do journalistic work, they provide educations. And uh, here is one of their best works. Nivesworthy. Nivesworthy is a kind of website that helps uh, all the journalists around the world to see what might be worth creating a story on. For instance, number of asylum applicants in Turkey, uh, from Turkey to Europe. And if there is an increase in that, Newsworthy SE shows it to you and you become aware that yeah, there is a story going on there. I, I need to send my reporters to there. So let's see. How it works. Mm -hmm. ah, here is the website, sorry. For instance, these data sets are gathered from Eurostats most of the time, but as you see, they provide you some formats that you can use in your own data thing. And you can get the data provided by them in the format that you would like to get. It can be an Excel file, it can be a CSV, CSV file, etc., etc. You can just get printable version of it and too many other options are available for you. So you can subscribe to different teams. Actually, I'm more into the economics and uh, freedom of speech. That's why these are the subjects that I get uh, news about the most. But let's go to other thing they have created. Uh, here, is some, here are some screenshots from their projects. So for instance, Now here is one of the works. I created one of it. It was like in five minutes, I created a work about people who applied for asylum in European Union or European countries and came from Turkey. And in, I, did, I did it just in order to show how it changes from month to month and what kind of political occurrences have impacted it. So I have a story there. Elections, economic crisis, referendum, another election. So each of them created an increase in the number of asylum applicants from Turkey. And in June 2018, uh, it was the date that my country went into election, uh, this reached its peak. And in July, it reached another peak. So here is a story. And here is a good story. Imagine that you 
use this visualization and under it you tell stories of 29 different people who applied for asylum in different countries of Europe. Why they applied asylum? Why and where did, where did they apply for it? And why did they apply for asylum in the country that they went for? Because nobody goes to Latonia, La Latvia, for instance. Most of the people go for Norway. Most of the people go for Sweden, Brussels, Germany. Why? You can ask this. So data journalism is not only about that. Yeah, it is all about quantitative data, but most of the time it brings you the chance of creating more and more stories with the data that you already gathered. So uh, here is another thing. Their work is not limited to these projects. They had Privacy International in their report regarding surveillance industry. So what is surveillance industry? I think you know the drones and all other stuff, uh, these drones which are watching us, these big uh, data gathering tools that are used for our GPS and all other stuff. And they created a kind of visualization about the data uh, that uh, Privacy International provided them. I'm not gonna show this one, it's not as good as their other works. So here is another thing. They worked on uh, Swedish media, Swedish local media, and what kind of news that they are working on. Uh, what, uh, which cities are covered more in Sweden? What type of topics that they cover? Oops. Let's see. If it's gonna work, yeah. For instance, here it is. You see some, yeah, where they are covering, what they are doing. I know that this uh, Swedish language does not help you that much. Let's press it. Okay, let's go back. So they have done some other things as well. Global hunger index. Have you ever wondered who, who are doing this kind of thing? Yeah, these people are doing this thing, and these people are paid a lot for this kind of mapping issues. And let's come to a local example from my country. Uh, da Media, it was established by a women journalist who is called Pnarda. She's one of the most genius people that I have ever met. I wish you could meet, it, meet her as well. So uh, they provide high quality data journalism products. And they all, most of the time, they use free and accessible tools. So you can do most of the things that they do. So uh, they, their website is blocked once in Turkey. You know how Turkey is. And they're good at data categorization and data visualization. Uh, they are not uh, that much dependent on storytelling or doing stories like the ones that I recommended. They are mostly working on data sets and data visualization. But there are some good stories that they have created so far. In Turkey, these high schools uh, focused on religious education is a big problem because secular education is at stake. They created a report about these religious high schools in Turkey. And they used uh, the free software, which is called Tableau, uh, for it. So they just created these lists. Which religious school has how many students? And whether we in Turkey really need these religious schools or not? And one of the things about their work was that in Turkey, most of the schools were being turned into religious schools without any excuses. There were secular people who don't want religious education. There were people who had different career plans for their children, but they were forced to go to religious schools because local secular schools, which, create, which gives uh, average education, were turned into these schools. And this data set they created was not only based on number of the students, it was also based on success of religious schools on university exams. 
So this data is avail available in the website of Higher Education Council. All you have to do is creating a data set and comparing the success levels of schools. So they create the good work done. So here is another thing. Uh, it was available in both print version and digital version. Uh, it is about lies that Trump said or told to us. Actually, uh, it's a good one. It is not uh, about these maps, big visuals, and all other stuff, but uh, I just want to show it to you. Yeah, here, I think it mostly looks like a kind of uh, timeline of his life because there's a kind of chronological order going on in there. Yeah, it's going, uh, yeah, it's long. It's getting longer, longer, longer. Yeah, I think they should do something about his sexual abuses as well. Here is another thing. Uh, you know, where his lies got more frequent or something like that. So here is another thing. When he told the public lie, when he misled the public, or when he didn't tell a public lie or falsehood. So yeah, it's a fear. Yeah. So these kind of things tell a story on behalf. Sorry. English on the board. Okay. Ah, okay, 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 so, <laughs> so, so here, uh, for instance, when he told a public lie, we know it. When he didn't tell a public lie, we know it. When he used a manipulation, we know it. There are, uh, actually, it looks like the Google Calendar that you use. It has no difference. You just tag the day with the lie that he told. So it is not a big thing that you are working on. It is just a thing that you can do every other day with the free tools that I'm going to suggest to you. So, oops, sorry. So, here is another thing. Uh, it is from South China Morning Post. It was one of the candidates of Data Visualization Awards of this year, like the one uh, with Trump. And it is using uh, one of these uh, story mapping techniques that I'm going to teach you today. Uh, and it is about the trade route, I got Belt and Road, in, uh, about the trade route from China and how it's going from China to West. Uh, let me open. Okay, Chinese government has killed it or? <laughs> you know, it's possible. Okay, I can show it to you. <laughs> so here's another thing. For people who like tennis, uh, this is uh, the data visualization regarding titles that uh, Roger Federer won in years and how he became the best tennis player of all the time. Oops. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Here, 20 years and 20 titles it's named. And it is categorized in the way that you see here are his ATP, this tennis tournament ranks from year to year in this statistical data. And here we see his journey from being in like 700s to being in first three. So as you see, there are many things that you can use here. And none of them are complicated. You can do such a thing via Photoshop. It's not that complicated. So uh, let's keep on with another example. How to release an Oscar-winning film? This is named. 
here you see some different uh, years or some different type of uh, films over there. And year by year, this data visualization tries to discover the method of publishing or broadcasting a film that is going to get international award in the end. So let's see. So two theaters or 1,000. How to release an Oscar winning film? You know, there are too many. There are thousands of cinemas in the United States. And you have to be strategical. In film industry, which movie theater shows your um, film is really important. No matter where you are. It doesn't matter if it is Lebanon, Turkey, USA. It doesn't matter. What really matters here in this story is that which exact saloons that you should broadcast in it or deliver it to, when you should publish this, and when or how you should deliver it. So here are some different examples of the films. And I think that you need to create, uh, spend more time on it. I think that my friends are going to send you the presentation, and you can look at it later. So, let's start with our job. How we are going to visualize data. We have seen some examples. I think that these examples were all uh, inspiring, inspirational. It's important to understand the significance of data and how, know how to uh, use it, how to position it. So, we need to help our audience to understand data sets more easily. Making a fancy or classy data visualization is less important than making an understandable data visualization. There are too many avant-garde data artists and you can see their jobs in contemporary art museums. It doesn't matter. What you have to think about is your audience. You know how we Middle Easterns are with numbers. We don't like numbers. Yeah. Do we agree on it? So you have to tell the story in the most easy, in the most understandable way possible. So let's start with working with charts, which is like uh, the most classical types of data journalism. So actually, easiest is the best. You should start with Google datasets or Google charts. This Google Charts is really important because it provides more than 100 different types of visualizing data. You choose what kind of data set that you have and it suggests you to use which kind of data. So another thing here, which is more important here is that Google Charts can work. Uh, how many of you use Google Spreadsheets? So you know about their dynamic nature, right? So when you change the data, your own graphic is also going to change because it is completely connected to that data set. For instance, if you are reporting on a referendum, you can still use Google Charts. Or you are, I mean, you are going to see Google My Maps uh, today. You can use that as well. Many countries, in Turkey there was a big debate because the state agency was the only resource of people to watch the news uh, election results. And most of the journalists became aware of it in the last minute. And there was a great discussion on the manipulation of the elections or election night. I don't say that it, is, it has affected the outputs, but it affected the credibility of the elections. If the independent media in Turkey had good teams, had good data sets, and if they had provided people with a non-biased data, they wouldn't have had such a problem. And they would have used Google Charts. They wouldn't have bought a big software for $10,000. So here is Infogram. Infogram is like, uh, it is free in your first 10 works. 
you can open an Infogram account uh, connected uh, through connecting with your uh, I'm say Google account or Twitter account or Facebook account. I just used uh, GIF here because uh, it shows how it works. So you can use charts, you can use maps, you can use specific maps that you created for a specific zone. You know, most of the things, most of the stories take place in really, really small places. Assume Paris attacks two years ago, three years ago, I'm not sure. They all happened in a really limited space. Yeah, it was all around Paris, but Paris is, lim li Paris is a limited space compared to all the world. And even in the same street, they, s they attacked two different places at the same time. Sometimes you have to show it as well. So Infogram provides you with maps that you can use or some, uh, to sell some or to tell some specific stories. Let's go on with this chart builder. It's not a spreadsheet editor. You cannot work on your spreadsheet on chart builder. You have to create your chart or spreadsheet first. You have to upload it to chart builder and you have to start working on it. So uh, it only produces static files, which means that in Infogram, you can put it in your website and when, once people work on it or once you ch change your data set, people are going to see immediate changes or people can discover the data through some interactive graphics, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Chart Builder is working on image uh, files, uh, SVG and JSON files like PNG, like JPEG, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is a kind of, it is a, it's not a dynamic. Uh, mapping or chart uh, building tool but in the end you can use it easily especially if you are working on printed press chart builder provides you kind of high uh, quality images that you can use later on so Let's keep on with data wrapper. Data wrapper is another thing, uh, actually an extended version of chart builder. Uh, it starts with data on a spreadsheet software and uh, move it to the data uh, wrapper. It offers more uh, charts than chart builder. That's why I said that it is an extended version. And it also offers some maps, interact interactive maps, Etc. So it, it also provides something for your website. To be honest, using non-dynamic images in your website is not as fancy as using interactive images. We can all agree on that. But here is another thing. Most of these tools that I propose to you are for web-based platforms. Chart Builder, on the other hand, as it provides some stable images, uh, it creates more high quality stuff and you can use it without, uh, how may I say, uh, without any suspicion easily. So here is raw graphs. You just get it from the Excel, as you see there. You can copy paste it, you can get it. You create your row. That's all, and it is going to create a graph type, a frame, a chart that you will want. So uh, actually, it is mostly for creating a raw material, not a kind of ideal output. If you have some skills, uh, like skills that enable you to work on Adobe Illustrator, or Gephi, or this kind of uh, visualization softwares, you can use that. Or if you are working on R, which I didn't mention today because it's a kind of advanced thing in my opinion, you can use it as well. So, mapping for journeys, it's not only about charts. Geography or using geotags is important part of telling stories today. And a lot of data sets which are published today have geographical components. I am sure that most of you use uh, location services of your smartphones, right? So every single step you take 
are kind of surveyed by the governments and it's data. Have you ever been curious about a tourist coming into this country and if the government is curious about what he or she is doing, if he or she is using his or her mobile phone, they know everything. It, all it needs is a tracking. So this kind of data is mostly private, but still used by the governments. And some successful journalists who have sources inside the government sometimes use this kind of uh, risky data in order to create stories. For instance, if they are following a terrorist organization in Germany, sometimes they collaborate with the governments. In America, it is more often. Actually, uh, in that way, I would like you to, I would like to suggest you a podcast, uh, which is called The Caliphate. It is really good. And in the story that you are going to see, how journalists were collaborating with governmental sources while they are trying to fact check their story, regarding the places that this terrorist told, or this person who used to fight for ISIS told, uh, about the places that he has been in, about the times that he has been there, etc., etc. So uh, you can use static or interactive maps uh, for telling a story based on geographical data. Uh, and you, it is the best way of visualizing data sets which includes a kind of chronological thing as well, or which is based on, for instance, election results. It's not chronological. You can use it for that. But if it is a story, for instance, attacks in Paris, or uh, uh, bombing attacks in Turkey, which took place between 2016 and 2018, for instance, it's a good uh, mapping story as well because they didn't all take place in the exact same place. So you can use these kind of things everywhere. Of course, it is not only about terrorist attacks or this kind of depressing things. It can be about earthquakes, uh, armed conflicts, spread of a disease, climate crisis. I think some of these are worse than terrorism. So you can discover more by maps by yourself as well. It's not only about what you get from it, it is also about how you are going to use it. Which part of the data set that would, would you would like to focus on? Which schools are, or clean water resources are located close to industrial plants handling dangerous chemicals? You can visualize it. How fast and in what directions was the forest fire in Athens was spreading? It is a really fresh story, right? You can visualize it. Whereas were threatened by the fire, were authorities doing what was necessary? You can answer this really crucial information, crucial question through data visualization. You can just do it by seeing your data set. So, here is the first tool that I recommend for uh, telling stories through maps. Uh, it's called StoryMap.js. It's created by NightLab which is uh, a big organization of journalism in, based in the United States of America. Uh, it is based on JS and JavaScript, but it is really good. Uh, you can use uh, tweets, Facebook posts, or uh, sorry, YouTube videos, Vimeo videos, Vine posts, and you can embed them in your posts through it. So I will show you some examples created with, oops, this. So here is one created by Washington Post. Of course, they changed a lot of codes with the app that I suggest, but oh, it's not working. Okay. It's how Islamic State has spread. It is a kind of old story, but in the end, uh, because th th that's why uh, some of the images are lost. But in the time that it was published, you could have seen that how their spread has taken a place. 
So it is the best way of telling people about such a threat. Because if you tell it like that, people will see how fast they are spreading and how effective they were. So another example, I think most of the people here know of Game of Thrones. Sometimes you don't have to work on classical maps. You know, Game of Thrones has its own fantastic map. And you can use map of Game of Thrones with this night lab tool. Now we see the journey of Arya, who was lost in the first season, I guess. And, you know, she is moving from place to place. Uh, sorry for the spoiler if you haven't watched it yet. I hope you watched. <laughs> so, uh, here is a one that I created for our website. It is about bombing attacks in Turkey, which took place in 2016 and 2017. So it took place in different parts of Turkey, like Diyarbakir, Gaziantep, and many other places around Turkey. As you see, I use some YouTube embed codes. And it's a kind of ongoing story. I haven't refreshed this story for so long, but in that it took me like 20 minutes because I already had the information I needed. So we saw these three types of examples with story map. All you have to have in order to create a story with story map is you have to have a Google account. It's all free. There are too many tutorials in their websites. It's really basic. And we don't have time, so I can't go uh, on working on this stuff. I wish we had a workshop over that. So let's keep on. What do you have to have in order to create mapping with story map? So you have to have a geographic data. Uh, most of the time, you need a series of events, so a chronology. You need multiple media sources. Just a map wouldn't probably be uh, kind of uh, sufficient. And you need a narration. You need to have good use of language because in the end, people, yeah, they are just browsing, browsing, browsing. You shouldn't let people just browse. You should get people in your story. That's why language is still important. It's not only about quantitative data. So uh, it is, uh, here is a kind of uh, less, uh, a version that needs less effort to work on, Google My Maps. Like all Google tools, which I don't like, but I still have to use because they're easy. Um, Google My Maps is a kind of service that you can use for creating your own maps. Uh, it enables you to create your own maps all around the world, and uh, you can use too many uh, icons, uh, and you can use multiple data sets at the same time on your map. So here are two maps that we published in our website in Turkey as well. Oops. So here you see uh, the presidential uh, election. There was a presidential election in Turkey. It was with general elections. And here you see the map of the candidates uh, who have visited different parts of Turkey. So if you would like to uh, see a specific candidate, you just remove the click on the same person, and now you have only one of them. Here, he has only one point, because Selahattin Demirtas is still imprisoned in Turkey. He is the most effective leader in Turkey right now, in terms of the opposition, and he is still in prison. So you see the existing president of Turkey, yeah, he, he traveled a lot. Maybe more than that. And they might have missed some of the plays. Uh, she is like the Marine Le Pen of Turkey. And this was the uh, popular uh, central candidate against Erdogan. So as you see, each of these candidates have their different data sets, chronologies, etc. But you can use, you can create files for each of them and you can upload each of them to these data maps and you can 
tell a story like that. So here is another example. It is also created with Google Maps. Google My Maps, sorry. Uh, there was a referendum in Turkey a year ago uh, about the presidential system that was about the past. And here are the protests taking place. So each of these things, for instance, you see a walking man. Actually, it was a woman. She started walking from Istanbul to Ankara to protest the laws proposed by the referendum. Here are some of the protests took place. Here are the bans of the protests. And this X here, I don't know what it signifies. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot. So uh, let's keep on. It is another thing. Story map uh, ARCGIS. It allows users to incorporate audio into their maps in addition to normal features such as image and video. So, assume that you are working on a story based on uh, some audios that you recorded in different parts of the world. For instance, I think that there was a story like that about a Zidi woman uh, who had been kidnapped by ISIS. Uh, they, they, they found these people in different parts of the world after they escaped from ISIS and they made series of interviews with them. So you can tell their story from their own mouths and each time, because they have been located from place to place, and you can place the audio parts uh, about the incidents that have taken place in somewhere specific on that parts. So it will be a journey. Of course, not a nice one, but in the end, it will let people know how type of slavery that ISIS is forcing on its people, etc. So there are some uh, examples of story map uh, ARCGIS. Here we are going to see uh, a work called Hidden San Diego. <coughs> it is not very different from story map. And uh, it provides a kind of responsive uh, and appealing design. Its design is uh, better, as you see. So let's start. Okay. I, I use too many softwares to block them from surveying me that sometimes I can't show this kind of websites. I need to. Okay, sorry, but we have to kind of skip it. Uh, what is specific with this type is that in storymapnightlab.com, you cannot uh, create a narration that is very detailed. Its framework is kind of limited. It doesn't let you use some of the media types that you might need. And it doesn't give you control over the code of the stuff that you are working on. You cannot customize it as uh, well as uh, you are supposed to or you hope to. So here is another thing which is Map Hub. Uh, it provides another platform to create interactive maps. It allows you to add all the same elements that Google Map does and it gives you as many different options for the base of your map. Yeah, so you can use a political map, you can use a geographical map, you can use a map that is uh, based on I don't know, topography of the place, or roads, or I don't know, heat maps, etc., etc. So it is only, it is not only about maps. You can use timelines too, because most of the data sets also use, also have uh, some data dependent on time on them. So uh, here are the things. For instance, Timeline uh, JS. It is also another night lab tool, and uh, you can just have your Google account and uh, log in into this website. It's also a free service. Here is Nelson Mandela's Extraordinary Life. It was created by Time, but 
with the exact same tool that you can use. So Mandela, a life of purpose, from his birth to death. Here you can see his journey. So it is completely based on some time spans of their life. So you can just get any Wikipedia article about a famous person and now start building your own timeline. Data is everywhere. All you have to do is cleansing data, taking the part that you need. So it doesn't have to be an Excel file. This uh, timeline night lab thing works based on Google spreadsheets. It brings you or it provides you a draft uh, data set that you can work on later. You change the values of the rows and cells and create your own graphic. It's really easy as well. So I don't have a lot of time. So <coughs> yeah. So here is another one. I built that one. I like it. So here is, it is about Donald Trump and his life story. Yeah, some of the images are lost, as you see. So he was born in New York, uh, German from his father's side, and etc., etc. So you can create something fancy like that. You can have a background image. You can have your own focus image. You can use most of the fonts, like Arabic, English, oh, sorry, uh, and all other uh, material. You can choose the font of your uh, material as well. So. Then, what about working on social network data? Yeah, it's kind of complicated, right? After Cambridge Analytica, working on such data. You know, Twitter provides uh, limited data sets. However, today, companies, organizations, and governmental organizations, governmental organizations, law enforcement agencies, they all benefit from social network data. And you need to know how to visualize it as well. So here are some free tools uh, that have also have premium versions. We start with Netlytic. You can get data from Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook from the API of Netlytic. Uh, it just uses, yeah, you can just analyze a hashtag. I think, I don't know how famous it, uh, it is in Lebanon, uh, Twitter, for instance. And for, in Turkey, uh, most of the digital political communication stuff goes through Twitter. And uh, many of the analyses are made uh, based on the hashtags that people use. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to show you many social network analysis tools. But today, it's enough to know uh, Netlytic. And social lab, it's another thing. Most of you have LinkedIn accounts, right? You are connected to some people, probably. I think you should, if you don't have. Um, and it's this service, social lab, shows what kind of network that you have, whom you are connected to, from which country, from which industry, from which organizations, what type of people, what kind of actors. It's a good one, and uh, I think that you really will make use of it. Uh, this is not Excel. It is a kind of add-on that you can use over Excel. It is also used for visualizing uh, social network data. Here, uh, for instance, how it here is the not Excel's own Twitter accounts or Facebook accounts uh, network mapping. For instance, you can do something like that. What is one of the most important issue in digital political communication today? Trolls, right? Or astroturfers. So if you would like to discover map of trolls in Russia, map of trolls in the United States of America, map of trolls in Turkey, you can just detect a kind of uh, hashtag which seems to be automated or enforced by these governmental agencies. You just write the name of the hashtag, Netflix gets, gets the data and provides you with the relationship sets. Who is in the center of this organization? Who is around this people? Who is around the center? Who is in the periphery or something like that? Tomorrow I will show you a lot of stuff about it. So. I'm just showing the visualization. 
So Gephi is another thing. It, you can think of it like a Photoshop for data. Uh, you can really work on complex data sets here. You can use uh, the raw data stuff that I mentioned before in order to create data sets or data visualizations with Gephi. Uh, it is used for expo exploring and manipulating data. It's written in Java language and uh, along with social network uh, analysis, it performs exploratory data and link, and link analysis and biological network analysis. So it's kind of big thing. So, where to find data? Yeah, in your country, in my country, there are many countries around the world, so it is hard to find. Sorry. Yeah, I know. And it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, Google Public Data Explorer is a service provided by Google in order to uh, let you find uh, uh, kind of data that you need. I'm going to open it in order you to see. Oops. Here you see data provided by non-governmental and governmental organizations around the world. So there are 113 different data providers in the database of Google services. And you can choose the data set that you would like to work on. You can get any of these and start working on it. So you just click on Explore the Data. Okay, so get something about okay. this or this. So, what you should do with this data? You just, someone can just provide you a random data set and what you are going to do with it. Are you going to build a chart? Are you going to, going to build a map? Are you going to build a timeline? What are you going to do with the specific data type that you get? So here are my first suggestions. The first suggestion is uh, you need to know the capacity of your website the first if you are working on map. If you are working on a printed platform, you should make some different choices. You should work on the services that generate stable images other than dynamic images. So uh, first of all, you need to uh, decide what kind of tool that I need, interactive or stable. Secondly, you should go on with what kind of uh, website design, for instance, if you are going on the dynamic one, what kind of web uh, do I have? Are my, is my host, uh, how may I say, uh, powerful enough. How many visitors this post is going to get? Because data visualization sets, especially interactive ones, get a lot of uh, megabytes from your traffic most of the time. So you need to think on your audience as well. For instance, if 80% of the, your website traffic is driven through mobile channels, you should use uh, the least complex data sets, least complex data visualization. Today, of course, uh, the screens of smartphones are bigger than ever. So you can get big data sets on the people's phones. But in my opinion, you have to, after you work on a data set, it's, it's hard to change what you have done. So please take a look at the other works done with the same tool before starting using a tool. And don't forget, today we are living in a kind of multi-dimensional world. So you have to test all the data visualizations that you have created on different platforms. You should look at it in your Mac. You should look at it, yeah, or PC. You should look at it in your tablet, or you should look at it in your telephone. Actually, it is easy. You just can uh, resize the window if it is a responsive thing, and you can see. So here, uh, I wait for your questions now for our last 10 minutes. OK. Let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. It's a very interesting topic for me because part of the, my graduation study included data visualization. And um, I have two questions for you. Uh, first, I would like to give you an example that I personally uh, worked on, like the analysis of the work. It's Broken Homes. Um, it's a project that was done by Al Jazeera, and they did uh, data visualization using maps and um, videos in an interactive way to talk about the home demolitions in East Jerusalem. So for everyone who is interested, please take a look. It's very interesting. Um, my question is, um, so to what extent should you go in details when you prepare the audience for data visualization? For example, in the case that I'm talking about, it's very complex because it's politically called economic and it has so many dimensions. So to what extent do you go in details? And the second question, um, when you go and, and you select the, the data that you want to work on, um, and you go to the, between the phase of selecting data and finalizing it and then going into the design, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming you either work by yourself if you have the capacities or you work with a designing team. Mm -hmm. So what's like, um, the kind of check that makes you do the balance between, because if you work on a data for a long time, you become so familiar with it and sometimes the audience might get confused. So do you do kind of user experience or how do you make sure that your audience can understand the data after you've worked on it for a long time and you would understand it more than anyone else? Uh, actually that's far, uh, that I'm going to reply to two at once, so, 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 so two of them at once. First of all, it completely depends on your economic capacity. You know, uh, according to research, uh, the amount of money reserved for news production is decreasing all around the world. Uh, first of all, if you have an aim for your work to be internationally recognized, you can work on details as much as possible. Details matter in these kind of studies, if you would like to get an award or something like that. But as I said before, some people are going to see your story, a data visualization on their mobile phones, which means that they will probably have a much shorter time span to consume the uh, product that you are pr producing. So in my humble opinion, if you, are work, if you are doing it for prestige and if you have resources for it, you can create a user-friendly version of data and you can create a prestige version of data visualization. So both of them at the same time. I don't know if I can answer your question properly in that way, but that's my opinion. Uh, the, the second thing is, uh, now we have Google Analytics. We know our audiences, right? where they're connecting from, which type of uh, softwares they are using, browser they are using, phone they are using, PCs they are using. So I think that you should take them into consideration and then you should decide if you are going to work with a designer or statistician. So in my opinion, new data, data journalism is a new concept. You, can, you don't have to work with four or five data designers. As you see, most of these uh, free tools are available to everyone. And tutorials are available on even YouTube. So you don't have to uh, spend a lot of money on data visualization and pay art people. My question was, it's not like about the design. Even if you're using these tools, how do you make sure uh, that your audience is understanding the, the information or the story you're telling through the visualization, regardless if you're using a designer or using these tools? It, I think it depends on, for example, uh, the, the, the first example you mentioned where they, with the Panama, I think, uh, yeah. one. Uh, that was like a user-friendly, it's very basic. It shows every, all the elements. So b after you do all this work and you have it on an app or on a website, is there kind of any, uh, I don't know, focus groups or anything that you uh -huh. do like these kind of 
uh, yeah if you if you if you have resources for instance if you are working for a consortium most of the time you have focus groups or most of the time you just take ideas of other journalists within your network most of the time it's a group work that's why people say that it's too complicated or it's too simple so uh, the resolution comes by itself but uh, considering that uh, are you working on a uh, first if you are working on a local community if your target is local I think that you should have some insight of the public that you are addressing but if it is global in my opinion it means that if it's in English for instance it means that it has a potential to become a global product so in global products I look for details yeah you're welcome here lady, uh, lady. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting presentation. I do have. Is it working? Okay. Um, I have three questions. Uh, the first is how do we proceed in a, like in an area where surveillance is very high and where uh, media press or like freedom of expression is very limited. So, uh, if you, if a journalist uh, wants to work on a. Um, like a data set or anything in the Arab region, for instance, how does he proceed uh, in secrecy uh, to approach a, a, a bigger group to work with? Um, huh. Okay, let me answer one by one because okay. we have three questions. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm not that uh, expert on uh, how what is going on in Arab region, and uh, what, uh, I know that freedom of speech here is limited, like Turkey. Uh, but the thing is data is there and it is more obvious than quoting someone saying bad things about the government all journalists do these days is quoting people as i said before so i think that it is less less risky if you are working on data especially if you are working on open data but what makes it risky in my opinion is that it is proper journalism proper journalism is risky everywhere so i can't have uh, I can't suggest you something like you have to do it this way or that way but I can suggest you one thing as you saw in Paradise Leaks and all other leaks most of the time people gathered the data stories and they became the source of data and they shared the data with global investigative agencies so they did it together so they pro protected shield for these people so I think that's the f answer that you're looking for most of the time uh, and the question is, what about the timely aspect of sharing a news story or a news report? Because uh, from what we've seen, I, uh, I felt that most of the um, examples were a bit of retrospective. Like you have something that happened and this is just an illustration for the process. So is it only that way or can uh, digit, uh, like data journalism also be... Um, like yeah, it timely? can be either evergreen that you can always uh, take a look at it whenever you want or something like that. But it can also be interactive data like election nights, etc. as I mentioned before. So it doesn't have to be a stable data set which is used all the time in the same way possible, etc. etc. It has to be. The, the only thing that you should look for should be like, uh, do I have enough budget for it? Do I have enough human resources for it? And do I, do I have the guts for it? because, you know, of the things that you mentioned before. So, gentlemen and gentlemen. <laughs> One question. Okay, he was raising hands before, so. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Sarfan. How do you make sure that these statements are true? And if these statements are true, how do you deal with them from your point of view? And how do you hear these statements? بتعديل على هذه البيانات للأشخاص العاديين. Yeah, I need. Ah, can. Sorry. So can I hear the translation again? صباح الخير دكتور سافان. بالبداية نشكرك على هذه المعلومات القيمة سؤالي هو كيف يتم التأكد من صحة هذه البيانات وإن كانت هناك معلومات مغلوطة كيف يتم آه يعني معالجة هذه المشكلة من خلال منظورك وهل تسمح هذه المواقع بمعالجة هذه البيانات 
من خلال الاشخاص العاديين شكرا Actually, uh, it is the specific thing with open data sets. It can, they can be manipulative. They can be used for consuming you or changing the ideas of the public. But you have uh, data on specific issues provided by several platforms. For instance, there is a data set provided by uh, Women and Family Ministry of Turkey regarding domestic violence against women and children. And there are too many non-governmental organizations working on exactly the same area and publishing their own reports. So there, are, there is a kind of, you can do uh, fact-checking through looking at different data sets at the same time. So the credibility of data is completely dependent on your journalistic capabilities. And as I told you before, it doesn't have to be a complex data set all the time. And you don't have to work on something controversial all the time. For instance, statistics agencies of governments are always publishing data, and they are mostly not manipulative about ages of people living in this exact region, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you have doubts, you need a group. If you don't have doubts, just publish your data. Yeah, that's the only thing I can say because classical fact-checking courses that you can take from sources like Pointer News University, Learner.com, etc., you can use them as well. But in my opinion, uh, in the end, yes, data is also manipulatable, like all other things around the world. But you can still have multiple sources of data. And most of the time, the, the institutions which release the data release their methodology as well. You should start with questioning their methodology. So for instance, uh, an, a survey done with 30 people cannot mostly uh, represent the whole society or something like that. So it's not a data that you need uh, or that we are talking on, but in the end, you need to look at the methodology. And you also, yeah, of course, you shouldn't look at the uh, data sets provided by governments for reasons of propaganda. For instance, if Turkish government today provides a data set saying that economy is going much better than ever, ah, don't, 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 don't believe it. Don't use it. That's all your journalistic skills. Thank you.